So the answer is not, do I just become a little bit less nice or a little bit more asshole or, you know, no. That is, the answer is, is, is up above that. It comes from us being able to soothe our anxiety. It comes from us being able to release our shame. It comes from us being able to bond with other men. It comes from us being able to live with purpose and passion and ask ourselves what feels right to me and then do it. It, it. it comes from being what I call in the book an integrated male, authentic male, an embodied male, open heart. I mean, there's, there's a conscious male. There's a lot of words that we could use for it, but it's not just reacting. It's, it's rewiring our nervous system and developing a new paradigm that, that shows us a new way of interacting with the world. And, and mainly it means doing it on our terms, doing it our way, getting comfortable in our own skin. One of the things that, that I've said that women are naturally attracted to a man who knows where he's going and looks like he's having a good time going. everybody and this week's episode is brought to you guys by Skillshare guys you know that Skillshare are our amazing partners they are a one-of-a-kind online learning community where you can learn all types of amazing creative entrepreneurial and design skills if you have not and got on Skillshare go ahead and sign up for Skillshare immediately guys they have so many amazing courses like the finding your purpose course and as always if you want to build up more skills i highly advise you guys hop on the video editing i don't know how many times i need to say it go to skillshare.com slash some roommates and get yourself skillshare for free yes guys i've said it so many times it is free you do not have to pay any money there's no excuse to not level up financially not level up creatively so go to skillshare.com slash some roommates Thank us later, and let's get to this week's episode. Yo, what's good, everybody? This is Hafiz, and welcome to another episode. Guys, I know you see it. It is indeed another Zoom episode, and you know what that means. I don't do Zooms, guys. You know I don't do Zoom. So if I am doing a Zoom episode, what it means is I am bringing in somebody whose message will change your life, somebody whose message has impacted my life and someone who is tangibly helping the lives of thousands of men all across the world. And if you guys are signed up via Patreon, you guys know I have a reading list. And on my reading list is the new roommate who is gonna come on the show, who has so much powerful things that he wants to teach and help when it comes to men, please, Welcome to the show. Coming all the way from Viva La Mexico, the one and only do Dr. Robert Glover. Uh, Hafiz, you make me smile. It's just your smile makes me smile. Um, thank you for that buildup. It's good to, good to be here. Good, good we got through some of these technical issues of being able to talk to each other. Uh, but we're here. We're looking at each other. We're talking to each other. And I'm, I'm excited to be on your show. Thank you so much, Dr. Glover. And like I said, um, um, we have a, a brand, a community, a company, all these good things called The Roommates. And the goal is to help men become the best version of themselves physically, emotionally, spiritually, and financially. And so we've just been, I've been doing this work for over 11 years. And, and in regards to the, the Roommates brand, we've been doing it for about five years. And so one of the things that I noticed was a lot of guys were struggling with these nice guy tendencies. And I, and I was constantly hearing, getting emails and messages from men over and over and over again. And then I said to myself, I said, man, I need, I need to write a book about the problem with being a nice guy. <laughs> and, and before I even thought about, you know, that idea even further, I said, maybe somebody else wrote a book <laughs> about being a nice guy. I went on Amazon, I typed in the word, a Mr. Nice Guy, and lo and behold, I found your book, and I can honestly say you did an exceptional work, and I'm really thankful for all your years of practice to be able to help men become the best version of themselves. Well, thank you. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm like you. I've been working with men for well, – been doing this work for over 30 years, really focusing on men for almost 25 years. Same thing. I, I want men to be their, their best selves and live their best lives. And um, – 
and and I'm just thrilled that you know my book is is it, 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 the, put it this way: it's been out about 20 years, and the royalty checks keep getting bigger every year. So that yes, means sir. more more and more people around the world are finding it, and it's in several languages now. And uh, this is this is what I love doing. I mean, again, your your excitement is uh, and your enthusiasm is contagious, and I feel the same way. I love talking about men, helping men, working with men. So I, I'm, I'm really excited about having this call with you. And I'm letting you know right now, if you thought the royalty checks for 2021 was big, wait till 2022 because I require every <laughs> single man as part of my community to read your book. And we're, we've been growing rapidly, so I want you to know there's a lot more big checks coming. <laughs> all right, all right. I like hearing that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, so for the people who don't know your background, Dr. Glover, what made you get into helping men and what was your genesis in regards to the men's improvement space? Well, it started with me. Um, I, I, I'm a recovering nice guy. And, and that's why I think so many people that, that read No More Mr. Nice Guy relate to the book because I have a PhD in marriage and family therapy, um, which, you know, I've, I've used professionally and it's helped me. But the book is not about stuff I learned in graduate school. It's what I learned in real life. It's what I learned in personal therapy and in men's groups and 12-step groups uh, about why being a nice guy wasn't working for me. And just to kind of give the quick overview, um, about almost 30 years ago, I, I was in my, my early 30s, mid-30s, in my second marriage. Um, mm -hmm. My wife was unhappy all the time seemingly angry all the time, never wanted to have sex anymore. And, you know, I was doing everything I could think of to make her happy. I, I, was, I was giving her stuff. I was trying to please her in every way I could. Uh, I was a conflict avoider, so I hated the fights that she always seemed to want to have. And, um, and then, you know, about, two, about three years into the marriage, she, she said to me, she said, I can't, I can't take you anymore. I said, what? Mm. You can't take me. You're the one that, you know, <laughs> you're the difficult one here. And she said, and she said, I can't take your passive aggressiveness. Well, I already had, I had a PhD, like I said, and I didn't even know what, what she meant when she said I was passive aggressive. And she said, I would rather be with an asshole because at least I know an asshole is going to treat me bad all the time. She said, everybody thinks you're such a nice guy and you treat me well, but then when I'm not expecting it, then you really hurt me. You cut me down. You embarrass me. You, 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 you do things that are really hurtful. And she goes, you need to go get help. And I thought, well, I think you actually are the one that needs to go get help because you're the one that's never happy. And now you're telling me that, you know, it's me. And, um, but I went and got help and luckily I landed in some good places. I actually joined a 12 step group, uh, for sex addicts. So my wife kept saying, you're a sex addict. And I thought, why does wanting to have sex with my wife make me a sex addict? You know, you used to want to have sex. Now you don't. Um, so I went and, and I, I quickly found out I wasn't a sex addict. I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't having enough sex to be addicted to it. And, um, but it was the perfect place for me to land because I, it, was a, it was all men. It met like six o'clock in the morning, one, one morning a week. And for the first time in my life, like I said, I was in my 30s. And um, for the first time in my life, I just started revealing me, just talking about me, uh, my dark side, my fears, my impulses, anything I had shame or guilt about. And, you know, the only reaction I got from these guys was, thank you for sharing, Robert. Nobody was offended. Nobody was freaked out by anything. And I also started working with a therapist at that time. And uh, I remember it was, a, it was a woman therapist. And very first session, she got a string out and put it on the ground and taught me about boundaries, personal boundaries. And, you know, again, I was in my 30s in my second marriage with a Ph.D. in marriage and family therapy. I'd never heard of boundaries before. And I quickly started learning uh, about how to set boundaries, how to make my needs a priority, how to be honest. I just you know, started finding out things about my whole nice guy paradigm of me trying to give to get and please and avoid conflict and, and hiding the truth if I thought it would upset anybody. I started realizing why those patterns weren't working well. And I even started getting an idea of some of the things my wife was talking about mm. when she said that, you know, she couldn't live with them. And around this same time, as I started really kind of get some clarity about why my own nice guy um, belief systems and, and patterns weren't working, 
in my um, therapy practice, you know, I started noticing a lot of the men coming either individually or with their wife or girlfriend were saying the same things I'd been saying uh, in my marriage. Uh, I'm a nice guy. Uh, I, I treat her better than her ex. Uh, I, I try to make her happy. I do everything for her. I'm raising her kids. I buy her everything she wants. She's still not happy. She's still angry all the time. And she never wants to have sex anymore. And I thought, mm-hmm. I can finish these guys' sentences for them. So I started 25-plus years ago a No More Mr. Nice Guy men's group. We met every, every other Wednesday night. And every Wednesday, I, I, I decided to dedicate to just writing. And I just started writing things I was, like, learning about me, about nice guys, how we got to be this way, what our internal paradigm or roadmap is, how to do things more effectively. And I started giving these chapters to, to the guys in my groups. And over time, these, these men and their wives and girlfriends often said, Robert, you need to write a book. You should go on Oprah. This could be a bestseller. And um, yeah. so I kept writing. It, it did get published, like I say, almost uh, 20 years ago. Never made it on Oprah. Um, and, but it, it, it does sell well. So yeah. a lot of people said, Robert, a lot of people need to read this book. And uh, so I wrote it knowing that someday you'd go looking for it. That's why I wrote hey. it. You didn't make it on Oprah, but you made it on The Roommates, so that's even better. I made it on The Roommates. Yeah, Oprah who? I mean, yeah. <laughs> no, um, Dr. Glover, though, that's really interesting because what, I, what I've noticed from a lot of individuals, especially in your space, is that, you know, it starts internal. It starts with looking at yourself and seeing a problem and then finding tangible solutions to the problem which is self, which then leads you to now use the solution that you learned that helped self to help other people. And so in regards to the, the word um, a nice guy, how do you define a person as a nice guy? What do you define that as? Uh, that's a good question. So uh, I'm going to give you a little elevator pitch and then we, we can back up and kind of expand that a little bit. But a a nice guy basically is a guy who doesn't believe he's just okay. He's okay just as he is. Mm. Um, He believes he has to become what he thinks other people want him to be and hide anything about him that he thinks people might have a negative reaction to. Now, Mm. this is based on something that's called toxic shame. And toxic shame is a belief, an emotional belief, deep in our emotional brain that says, I'm not okay. There's something wrong with me. I'm, I'm, I'm not good enough. And that gets internalized at a really early age, I mean, in infancy, before we can even think about things in the world. When we have painful or uncomfortable experiences as little children, we're narcissistic by nature, we're grandiose, and we think everything that happens to us, we caused. Mm. And again, this is an emotional belief, not an intellectual belief. Yeah. And, and so whenever we have a painful experience, we believe we cause it, so therefore something's wrong with us. And Mm -hmm. that gets stored up in an emotional part of our brain called the amygdala. And the amygdala, which uh, deals with survival, is where our fight-flight-freeze mechanism comes from, is wired into every other part of our brain. So that becomes our emotional operating system, uh, our our machine language, the the language that kind of like a computer runs on, and every application runs on top of that. So our emotional belief system is, I'm not good enough. There's something wrong with me. That is wired into every other part of our brain that says, okay, now what do I have to do to be liked and be loved and get my needs met? How do I get that person's approval? How do I avoid conflict with that person? How do I hide anything from them that, that they, they might not respond well to? And it, it be, this becomes our paradigm, our roadmap for living life. And if you, can, if you just imagine, if you just break it down, what, what kind of life are we going to live if every single moment we're either trying to get somebody's approval or avoid their disapproval? And that's what, that's what nice guys are doing, often at a very unconscious level. No, that's, a, that's an exceptional definition. And so similar to the book, I want to I take a step backwards to um, how did this era of the nice guy existed? And so can you give us a, a brief history of you know the what men were like in the early 20th century and then how it led to a culture of nice guys into the late 20th century and the early 21st century yeah and i do a review of that in the book but let me give just a, a kind of a, a bird's eye snapshot let's go back even further than earliest 20 early 20th century let's go back eh, a million years ago uh, a million years ago we, we were tribal 
We, we were communal. We, we men were hunters and gatherers and warriors, and we were part of a tribe. And, and we, we, we traveled and moved and searching for food, for shelter, for uh, just whatever we needed to survive. We were always on the move. But as men, we were always together, always connected, and hunting together, fighting together, supporting each other, and, and, and pulling each other through. Now, that era of human evolution lasted about a million and a half years, according to anthropologists. And about 10,000 years ago, so not very long ago in human history, we humans started settling down a little bit. Not, 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 not all tribes, but, but a few started settling down and staying in one place, owning a piece of land. Agriculture developed around this time. Started growing things, domesticating animals, and, um, and, and, and still men were very connected. Still, we connected, we had extended family, we're part of tribe, often, again, still fighting together, working together. And then come, that, that period lasted up until the Industrial Revolution, where men actually started kind of leaving the farms and going into a city, and going into a factory, and starting to, to, to work there. But even then, that was still mostly with other men, that men went and worked with men. And this, this continued on into the 20th century until about World War II. And in World War II, when all the men were off fighting, women started coming into the factories to, 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 to build stuff and make stuff so to support the war effort. And when the men came back from World War II, it was a completely different world and workplace. Now women were working more, women were getting more education. I mean, prior to that, women worked and had education, but most women were probably homemakers, were probably some more supporting uh, their husband. Now, I'm not trying to say any one of these eras of, of human existence is better or the right one, but these are just changes we've been through. And mm -hmm. so as we move forward and into you know, the last half of, of, of the, the 20th century into the 21st century, I think those, some of those significant changes of, of men's connections began to dissolve. Um, the, the men's club, the rotary club, the places the men went where men went to work began to, to dissolve. And part of this was there began to be kind of a change in the family. Little boys weren't around their fathers very much. Go back 100 years ago, a little boy would have grown up around his dad, his uncles, his cousins, usually working on a farm. Now his dad's off working somewhere, doing something he doesn't even see. Around this time, uh, after World War II, the 50s and 60s, divorce shot up, which means that a lot of boys started growing up without their dads around because of divorce or growing up with single moms. Uh, w Vietnam War came along, and this really divided an older generation of men from a younger generation of men. And the younger generation of men, kind of more my generation, um, you know, kind of became the hippies and, you know, the, you know, the doing drugs and growing their hair long and, and rebelling against kind of the warmongering attitudes we saw of our fathers. And that created another real riff for men. Um, and then feminism came along where, you know, there's... Uh, an angry message that you know men are bad, every man's a rapist, and erection's a sign of aggression. Uh, it just there's all this, uh, that vibe going on that di disrupted culture. Then as you get boys starting to get, get, get into school, kindergarten, elementary school, the, all of a sudden now they're with, they're with women teachers all day long. And for several years, that's all, the, all they're around is women. The men are like out of their life now. And so I've often said, for most boys, getting from third grade to fourth grade, they not only have to learn their reading, writing, and arithmetic, but how to please a woman. You know, they, mm. they, they got to make this female teacher happy if they're going to get on to the next grade. And then that's kind of where, 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 where I wrote No More Mr. Nice Guy. That's kind of how things were at. But now move forward with just, you know, the Internet. Every, every millennial and younger has grown up with broadband Internet, a cell phone in front of them all the time. And nowadays I start hearing a lot of the young men I work with say, my dad was a nice guy. My, my dad wasn't setting the tone or leading in the family. He was passive. And his only words to me was, don't upset your mother. You know, that, he, was, he was intimidated by mom, and so, you know, he, I didn't have any help in dealing with my angry, controlling, you know, domineering mother. So I hear a lot of young men talk about that. If dads were there, they often still weren't there. 
really, so mm. to speak. So what's happened for a lot of men is we've not been initiated into a, a, a masculine world that's challenging, that's scary. We've not had other men teach us how to go get comfortable being uncomfortable, how to relate to women, how to live with purpose and passion, how to get a job done. And so what, what I see now is a lot of men of, of all ages, my ages and younger, but especially the younger men who've grown up with the Internet, they hang out what I call the nursery where they, they just do things that don't challenge them. They're, you know, they grew up playing video games and, and watching nonstop television and surfing the Internet for hours at a time and, you know, drinking, smoking, eating junk food. So a lot of men nowadays don't know how to deal with challenge, whether it's the challenge of a woman or a relationship or the challenge at work. You know, they want to start their own business, but they never actually get it going, mainly because they, again, have not had that masculine initiation. They're hanging out in the nursery, watching TV, surfing the Internet, smoking pot, playing video games, jerking off to porn, you know, hanging out with women they're not having sex with, trying to get validation. And, and there's, there's all of that peace that you know they they just don't know how to deal with challenge so that's the mm. younger generation that i see coming along but but the piece of all of this is is still that core thing of believing there's something wrong with me uh, and again i, I got to make other people happy and get their approval and i got to avoid disapproval so what i see a lot of men nowadays just don't take any risk whatsoever they see a woman yeah. they want to talk to and never walk up and talk to her they just don't take the risk or if they're in a relationship you know, their, their, their wife's upset at them, but they never take the risk of, of actually digging down to what's really at the core. Maybe they have a job, but they don't take a risk of doing what it takes to either move up or go start their own company. And, and yeah. so it gets manifested in a lot of avoidance of risk. Mm. So no, that's, is, that, that's is that a big enough picture for you? <laughs> no, I love it. I love it, man. No, I love it because, you know, I think, uh, I don't know if you made this term or I made this term. <laughs> so it probably was you, but uh, the term, the anti-man. So uh, I'll give you what, credit what we, for that one. Okay. Did you, but was that in your book? Though? I don't think I used anti-man, so I, I'm giving it to you. Okay, okay great. <laughs> if, when, when I use that word, I'm going to give you credit. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> but you, you talked about the idea in your book where you had, um, especially... What, do you consider yourself the boomer generation? Yeah, I really am. I'm, I'm 65 now, so you know I'm, I'm right. technically able to retire. I'm, I'm on, I'm on Medicare now, so you know I, okay. I don't feel like an old guy, but I, I, I age-wise, I qualify to be an old guy. <laughs> yeah. So I think, like you said, during the boomer generation, especially during that Vietnam era, what we saw was a transition from you know men being valued from their masculine. Ta um, uh, capabilities to now society pushing men to their more feminine soft skills right and so what then ended up happening was you saw a lot of mothers similar to what you shared whether they were single mothers because of no fault divorces and things along those lines or whether they were just they had husbands at home where they where they wanted their child um, mainly their son to be what they consider the anti-man right the opposite of whatever macho yeah. character we try yeah. to society yeah. paint yeah, and, 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 that, so, and that was true for me because my, my mother, when I was a boy, told me, I'm raising me and my brother to be different than our father. Now, exactly. bless, bless her heart, she later apologized for that, both for telling yes. me that and for trying to do that to make me different than my dad. Your, your mother must went through a crazy uh, um, revelation for having self-accountability because sometimes women struggle with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other road we can go down. But yeah, my, my, <laughs> believe it or not, you know, just, just as a snapshot, my, my mother was probably the more masculine person in my family. My dad was the more the moody, emotional, unpredictable. My mom was, a, when something needed to be done, she went and figured out how to get it done. And, and so, and, yeah. And Dr. Glover, what I've, what I've noticed is when you think about the messages given to men in the late 70s and onward into the um, early 21st century, you see this message that's always about femininity, you know, feelings, emotion, be soft, be sweet, be caring, be gentle, be nice. But then you think about the messaging going to women. You know, be strong, be powerful, be in charge, be independent, you know, don't take no crap from nobody. So what you began to see in the messaging was that the men were be beginning to be more effeminized by society. But then on the flip side, women were beginning to be more masculine. And so 
I've noticed, especially in the single mother households, the, the, the moms always will tell their sons, hey, don't be like your dad who was this, you know, alpha, whatever, machismo guy. And they will tell their daughters, well, I need you to be strong and powerful so that you don't need a man in the future. Yeah, don't so I, don't I ever be dependent on a man. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you're right. There's, there's been quite a shift. When I was in graduate school in the 80s, um, I didn't know it at the time, but the, the, in, in, in graduate school, at least my teachers in, in, in the child development courses I took, um, were teaching it from a feminist bent. And again, I didn't really realize, I kind of got it, but I, I kind of learned to just keep my mouth shut, it, is that they, they would say that, that, for example, gender doesn't exist. They say it's a social construct. Boys aren't born boys, girls aren't born, born girls. Society says you're a boy, therefore you should be this way. You know, don't cry, be tough, blah, blah, blah. And little girls, or your girl, be passive, get married, have kids, blah. They said that's all just social constructs. And that's a lot of what feminism has worked to do, especially in the educational system, especially at the university level, is basically mm -hmm. now, now, now what you hear in school is there, there's as many genders as there are people. You know, there's mm -hmm. 8 billion genders out there. <laughs> I'm going, huh? <laughs> but, yes, our gender isn't just what genitalia we have. But here's what they taught me in, in grad school. They basically are saying, they were saying basically boys are bad, girls are good. They said mm. boys are, 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 are competitive, girls are cooperative. And so mm. we need to teach the boys to be more cooperative. So that's been mm. an agenda in the educational system for quite some time, is to make boys less um, competitive and more cooperative. And as you said, if you look around at, at, at the guys now, like you said, all right, we're sitting around smoking dope, watching YouTube, jerking off, and, you know, all right, we're not competitive anymore. And, and Jordan Peterson really gets into this, of, of how feminism attacked hierarchical systems. And he says, no, they're good to have hierarchical systems. They can be, they impulse to them, but they give us something to work for, to, to work yeah. up to, right? And then he says, but, but, you know, it's okay if the women get into the hierarchical system. So now if, what yeah. you look at is that it's the boys that are cooperative, you know, actually not challenging anybody or anything, not including themselves, yeah. and it's the girls that are competitive. Now, yes. women get more college degrees than men. In fact, a, a, an amazing percentage of men, don't, boys, don't even make it out of high school anymore. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, is women, they're getting the graduate degrees much more than men. And that's, that's all great. I'm not, I'm not saying anything's wrong with that. But the, the women are out there, you know, they, they grew up playing soccer. They're told be strong, be powerful, go get a degree, don't need a man, go make money. And it's now the women that are so competitive. All the while, I was taught in grad school, that's bad, right? Mm, but it's so powerful. like we, 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 we've just switched it. And, and again... I'm a big advocate that every person, as you say, should be able to live up to your full potential. And I think, I think um, competition can be a very powerful thing. And, and yeah. what's, what's funny, and I'll just add, this is just kind of an opinion, men, when they compete with each other, usually do it around a skill set. They compete around something external to them, even if it's like making money or playing a sport or, or whatever. Women, when they compete, they tend to make it personal. They compete about their person. Who's prettier? Mm. Who's sexier? Who, who's getting attention? And, and I think that's actually really toxic when, when yeah. you start competing around, you know, person. Oh, you know, she's ugly. She's fat. Those kind of things. Mm. Look, that kind of competition is hurtful. Yeah. Whereas my yeah. buddies and I, you know, I remember we could go play racquetball with each other and, you know, kick the shit out of each other. And as soon as we're done, we got our arms around each other and we're going to, you know, go have a good time and, and laugh. It wasn't yeah. personal. But the c competition did bring out the best in us, right? It sharpened yeah. us and got us at our edge. So, no. and the funny thing is, if you look at men nowadays, when they're at their best, they are cooperating. Look at a sports team. It takes cooperation to have a good sports team. Look at a rock band. You got to have cooperation to have a rock band. You, 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 and your your, your partners in in your show. You got men cooperating with each other to create a good product. So all these kind of definitions of of, of competition bad, cooperation good, blah 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 blah. I, I don't know that I buy into that simplicity of it. Competition can have be you, powerful. Uh, have you read um, George Orwell's Animal Farm? 
Oh, I read that in, in high school at some point. It's been a few years. Um, if, if, if you have a chance, uh, I encourage you, you and everybody else, watch Animal Farm again. And, and what you will notice is exactly what happened in Animal Farm happened in society. And without, without uh, ruining it, so if you guys want to actually watch it and me not ruin it, you can fast forward it. <laughs> but without ruining it too much, what you see is that the animals uh, who were once oppressed by the humans, um, they, they say, okay, the humans are the problem and let's overthrow the humans. And then they do so. But then what ends up happening is certain animals who were the leaders and the most vocal about overthrowing the humans start behaving exactly how the humans behaved. To the point at the end of the story that where they were exactly, they were simply the humans in animal bodies. And now it was okay. So similar to what you said, I see the very thing that you communicated. For example, I think um, the Atlantic did an exceptional article similar to what you shared about what's going on in higher education. In which in higher education, you see um, in some universities, 70% women, uh, you know, and, and extremely high uh, disproportional rates. But in the 1950s, 1940s, when colleges were predominantly male, upward between 60, 65% males, it was a huge problem. And when it was a huge problem in the 50s and 40s, they said we need to have an initiative and we need to focus in on um, providing more opportunities for women to come into college so it's not disproportionately male. But now on the flip side, when colleges are disproportionately female, there's no initiative, there's no push, there's, there's not the same zeal and enthusiasm into helping um, find ways to help males get into college as it was in the 40s and 50s when they're trying to help women get into college. Yeah. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something. It, it will always be that way. There's always going to be a double standard. And I know it's easy to feel kind of victimized by that, and we can, but that doesn't serve us as men. But that's where I think people like you and I and other men who are working with men, it's our job to help empower men. Getting a college yeah. degree isn't the end all be all. In fact, I think, I think most people shouldn't have a college degree. All you end I up agree. with is $100,000 in debt and, and getting the same job you could have gotten you know, without going to college. So yeah, it, yeah. It's, it, we've even kind of swallowed the hook line that college is good. Now I'm, I'm talking about somebody who you know, w went to college for a lot of years. Yeah. But here's the thing. What we men most need is not necessarily a college degree, isn't necessarily the government to come fight our battles for us. What we men need is other men to band together, create initiation, create tribe, and, and help each man be the best that they can be. To be their best in relationship, to be their best making money, to be their best you know, work career, be their best a, a, as a friend. And um, I'm excited. You know, when I, when I, when No More Mr. Nice Guy came out, 2003, um, the publisher Barnes and Noble sent me on a book tour, and I did a lot of interviews. And a lot of people asked me, "Well, do I see um, uh, a masculine uh, revolution coming, like you know the the, the, the feminism?" And, I, and for I said, "No, I don't think so." For two reasons. One, I said, I don't think there's one unifying factor that would bring men together in some kind of, uh, you know, revolution or some kind of big movement. I said, maybe parenting issues for single dads and stuff might, you know, divorce issues might. But I said, I don't see one issue unifying men. And I said, and the second thing, I didn't always say this in interviews because it might not always play well, but I think <laughs> where feminism has succeeded, it succeeded because of men helping it succeed. It was mm. uni male university presidents that said, yeah, we gotta hire more women professors. We gotta open the doors up more for women. It was men, male legislatures in state uh, uh, legislatures, federal government that started saying, yes, we gotta make things more equitable. We gotta have equal pay for equal jobs. Now maybe this job isn't even done yet of making things more equitable, but it was men that said, yes, there are wrongs here that need to be righted. That's one reason I, I, I love men. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah, there, there's, there's men that, I, I hate the term toxic masculinity. There are men that are bad men, but it is men that make the world good. It's men that have righted the wrongs. And so the, my second point was, I don't know that there's any one cause that would unify men that women would get behind to help support, right? Mm. So here's the thing. 
I said that I didn't see another, I didn't see a movement coming of men, but I've actually changed my story about that, partly right. because of the Internet. But, but when, I, when I started doing my own work 25 to 30 years ago, about all there really was was like uh, Robert Blythe's Iron John, Michael Mead, the mythopoetic movement, go out in the woods, beat a drum, have a talking stick, <laughs> say ho. And that was all cool stuff. I did some of that. Yeah. But there wasn't much else to, to it. But now what I see, primarily because of the Internet, I do see a worldwide men's movement. But here, it, 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 it takes a look. you got to look to identify it. You see men going and taking martial arts. You see men going and doing pickup boot camps. You see men going into divorce support groups. You, you mm -hmm. see men uh, going into other kind of awareness consciousness programs. You see, you see men going to 12-step programs to deal with addiction. And all of a sudden, everywhere around the world, with the internet, with men's coaches, with men's programs, men are seeking men. Whether it's through, I'm going to go be with a group of guys and do martial arts, or I'm going to be with a group of guys and go pick up women, or I'm going to be with a group of guys to talk about the pain of going through divorce, or I'm going to be with a group of men and have a Bible study, or I'm going to be with a group of men and have a poker night. Whatever it is, men are seeking men, and there's starting to be a cross-pollinization from all these different ways men are seeking men, and the Internet's really making that possible. I mean, like, just what you do is part of that process, you know, men having podcasts or having blogs about helping men didn't exist 10 years ago. Yeah. And now it's, it's, it's spreading. So I really do think this is a new era for men that may not come from federal governments passing laws and may not come from men getting into more colleges. I think it's going to come grassroots men helping men live their best lives and that's why that's why I never say no to an interview uh, people like you that are making men's lives better if they if they want me to talk about making men's lives better I never say no because I'm committed to it and and I want to honor people like you that are doing this work for men no I appreciate that and your and your work definitely has been transformational for all these years not only for my life but in the lives of others and two things stood out to me what you said the first thing is hundred percent right one of the biggest things we talk about in the roommates is no, you, as men, we don't complain. We make a change. We don't have the victim mindset. We have the victor mindset. I don't care the color of your skin, your handicap, where you're from, whether you have one dad, you know, whether you had two dads, I don't care what your story was. Every single man can make a change to his life by taking accountability, finding like-minded men and becoming the best version of himself. But the second thing that you said is really interesting where you said you didn't believe there was going to be a men's movement because one was there going to be a united issue that men can gather around and two you one of the things that you said was you didn't feel like women would come and support it and know what's interesting about what's going on today women are coming and supporting the men's improvement so in actuality it's, it's a true story a lot of people may not be aware of this but when we first started the roommates it was majority women we were still talking to men and doing men's t talk and men's issue, but it was a majority of women, especially um, when we created our Patreon community to be able to fund what we were doing. It was majority women funding, and here's wow. why. I like it. What, what I found is similar to what you said. In society, women became more masculine, men became more feminine, but, what's, but what has gone, what, what, where the boomers and Generation X is different from millennials and gener Generation Z is that millennials and Generation Z no longer settle for feminine men. You see, boomers and Generation X, they, they would settle for them initially for, because, you know, for whatever reason, whatever feminist ideology they would come to accept. But what I've noticed is that a lot of Generation um, Y and Z women, they are appalled by passive men, by lazy men, by uninspired men, by, by men who are not proactive and ambitious and courageous and competent and confident, all these great masculine things. So they're, 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 there's a, a, a frustration amongst them in regards to the lack of men who are these kind and caliber of men. So when they're seeing what we're doing, um, when they see that we're helping men become better, helping men become better physically, emotionally, spiritually, and financially, when, when they see us building the whole man, what that now is like, oh wow, they're making better men and there's better men over there. 
So it's kind of like, is this like this men reform factory that's now <laughs> you out better men into society and these women don't want the lights to turn off there, you know? Yeah, I, so, I hear you. I hear you. So I, I see that going on. I, I you know, and, and I do too. And that that's one of the things that, that encourages me as well is that, you know, now we got all these strong women out there that have been, you know, raised since they were little girls. Be strong, be strong, compete, be strong. And um, if they're going to be in a relationship with a guy, they want a guy that can match them. They don't exactly. want to come home and have the guy saying, yes, dear, what do you want to do tonight, dear? Okay, dear, you know, while he goes back again and smokes a J and, you know, plays a video game. They want a mm -hmm. strong man to match them. Yes. And, and here's kind of an interesting thing. When, when my book came out in 2003, the publisher, Barnes & Noble again, um, I think was hoping there would be kind of a feminine backlash to it. You know, the books, No More Mr. Nice Guy, mm -hmm. got kind of this aggressive tone to it. And I think they were hoping that that would then stir up, you know, you know some <laughs> me media energy and sell yeah, yeah. books. It never happened. It never mm -hmm. happened. And the funny thing is, you know, in terms of, of, of maybe in the last 20 years, I maybe have gotten maybe 30 emails, angry emails, maybe 30, mm. maybe 50, I don't know, probably not that many. <laughs> and the majority of them were from men. Mm. Uh, a, I, got a, I get a few from women, and they're usually along the line of, my husband read your book and left me. You're an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, you know yeah, but I don't even get many of those. But, you know, I get blamed for, you know, their, 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 their husband not putting up with them anymore. And, <laughs> and so there's not been a backlash to it. And, and when, like, if I sit on an airplane and talk to a woman about what I do, and I say, I work with men, what do you teach men? And I teach men, oh, about, about being honest and having purpose and passion and setting the tone and leading and being conscious and showing up. And, and you know, the women go, where do I meet these guys? Yeah. I say, Can I All come hang out? Can I hang out in your office, you know, outside your office in the parking <laughs> lot? Or will you, will you put a website together that has these? Because the women, a healthy woman wants a strong man. She, yes. she wants a guy that's got purpose and passion, who's honest, who's authentic, who's integrated, uh, who lives life on his terms. Mm -hmm. And that's attractive to a, a yes. healthy woman. And so I, I agree with you, is that I, I think there's, it's not black and white. There's two factions. There's the, there's the women that haven't bought into the whole all men are bad, women are all good thing. Yeah. Um, and they want, they want a good man. They want a strong man. There's still a current of almost all things men do are bad. There's, there's an article in the Washington Post just about three weeks ago where uh, a, a woman writer um, was profiling one of the guys in the riots on, on, on in, back in January in Washington, D.C. And he was the guy, I think, with the horns on everything in, in the Capitol building. And this whole article published in the Washington Post uh, magazine basically said that, you know, these radical men's groups, you know, whether they be white supremacists, whether it be blah, 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 all, all have this, they basically made this broad brush have, have a background in, in masculine empowerment, male empowerment. And she, she even referenced my, pers my coach and the men's program I'm in without calling it by name and wow. basically referenced it because, oh, it's a bunch of white guys sitting on rocks. And yeah. and then and and because he also has a women's program for women, and she quoted, you know, he says, women, once you've got your career, you've accomplished everything you want to accomplish, and now you 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 ask yourself, what am I missing? Well, you're you're missing love, right? Mm -hmm. And he said, if you're ready to open to love, you know, and she 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 attacked that from from kind of, of the feminist did. viewpoint that no, women, the only thing that women need is a career, you know, no, yeah. don't don't tell them they need love, don't tell oh them they need gosh. a man. And so she painted this broad up. brush of attacking everything, every, anything had to do with male or masculine empowerment, yeah. um, basically as, as being just a continuation of the patriarchy and oh of male God. privilege, especially white male privilege. And, yeah. and because one guy in the Capitol building, I never actually got the connection other than she just wanted to make this. So there's still this attack yeah. on almost anything that is masculine, including masculine empowerment. But 100%. yeah, a healthy woman wants a strong man. 
Yeah, it's a, it's unfortunate because first and foremost, Washington Post absolute garbage. <laughs> they, they haven't done real journalism in years, and so the, the the challenge is when you have these crazy women in you know who are writing these feminist ideologies. We those are the same women who at forty five are single alone with their seventeen cats, saying where's all the good men at? You know, like where did your lesbian dance theory get you now? You know, besides your little fancy journalism job, you know. So I don't. I, we can discuss <laughs> move from them later. But what's fascinating is that when it comes to the male improvement space, like you said, it's always a correlation between that and you know my 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 idol my, my idol is Jordan Peterson. I uh, with men like Jordan Peterson and as such to you know the idea of white supremacy and things along those lines. But what they fail to know about the male improvement, especially community, it's huge in black America, it's huge in Asian America, and it's also huge in Arabic America. It's it, those three places, like it's blowing up. The reason why it's blowing up in black America is so, especially, um, so true because so many black men grew up in single mother households. So I think, depending on which number you believe, anywhere between 70 to 80% of, um, of, of um, black children grew up in single mother households um, compared to, you know, other communities where I think Hispanics may be at the next close at 50 to 55%. So a lot of the things that you're describing when it comes to um, um, the development of the, the under development of men is happening in black community in mass. So you have this whole generation of guys who grew up, you know, um, feeling like being a man was evil and all men are bad and your daddy is bad and your uncle is bad and all the guys on the street are bad. They're now waking up to this message. As you know, when it comes to Asian American communities, one of the things about Asian culture is that, you know, sometimes there's a lack of um, masculinity that society, um, well, I guess there is a, at times a caricature of an Asian man being the least masculine of men. Uh, and so you see that to be something in which a lot of I've noticed a lot of Asian men, especially in Generation Z, are now trying to tap more into the masculinity and go against societal expectations of the, the submissive, docile Asian individual. And then the last thing in regards to the Arabic men is they usually a lot of them come from a very masculine culture. I mean, it's, these are just ideologies that are common sense to them. So now being raised in this Western world, a lot of these ideas go against their cultural values and their and their ideologies. So when they hear positive, healthy messages of um, calling men to a level of masculinity, it's it's a breath of fresh air because you know they've social um, socially evolved from those ideologies. So I think it's fascinating when people want to um, demonize the men's improvement space in regards to when it goes um, uh, when it um, deals with white. Americans, they don't realize that in the minority communities, these are where men's improvement is exploding I love because it. the masculine message is the most needed in these areas. I love it. You know, I and I, I, I see that in a lot of. I live in Mexico. My wife is yeah. Mexican. Uh, I, I, I speak Spanish. You know, because yeah. she doesn't speak English. I'm raising two kids, a stepson and a stepdaughter, and um, so I'm in the middle of Mexican culture. And, you know, the, we all know kind of the macho Mexican culture. And we were basically, the, the, the fathers are uninvolved. The mothers raise their boys to expect girls to take care of them and serve them. But here's what happens. Anytime you've got an extreme in culture, whether it's the macho culture, whether it's in black culture, if it's kind of the, the gangbanger culture, you know, if you've got things at one extreme, often people react to that by going to the other extreme. Exactly. And, and so oftentimes you do see the nice guy type child growing up in a macho culture, uh, a violent black ghetto culture, because it's like, what are your choices? Go, go, mm -hmm. be, go be this, this man that treats women bad, that uses them or that do, does drugs or sells drugs. Or, and so, okay, I'll go the other way. And, and, you know, the opposite of crazy is still crazy, but when you're a little kid, you don't know what else. I just don't want to be that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll go be this yeah, other thing. Now, the beauty of empowerment takes us out of the, the, that kind of black and white dichotomy. You're, you're either the asshole man or you're the pussy, you know, whipped kind of guy, that, you know, <laughs> yes, dear, yes, dear. Where we're really, we're, we're saying, no, neither one of those are healthy role models for men. That there's, yes. we're going to rise above that and, and, and bring a consciousness and embodiment and, and, a, and a, a band of brothers mentalities that we're going to work together to be our, to sharpen ourselves, to be our best selves. And, and again, 
I, again, I see that happening whether it's in pickup or martial arts or the, like an embodiment program that I'm in or this. I, I see men sharpening other men and giving each other a support system to go out in the world and deal with the shit in, in this world that's scary. And, um, yeah. and again, I, I think women benefit from that tremendously, as you've said, when now they've I got strong that. men. My, my second wife used to say to me, she used to say, how can I know you, you will ever stand up for me if you can't even stand up to me? Mm, and and, and she deep. was so, so true. She was so right. You know, you know I, she'd get that look on her face and I'd be quaking. Oh, no, don't be mad at me. Don't be mad at me. And she's going, yeah. how can I ever trust and depend you? you know, you're, she used to just say, I'm just a little girl making noise. And, you, and you, mm. you, get, you get all scared at a little girl making noise. What are you going to do when something real is out there <laughs> that needs to be dealt with? And she was right. She was right. She didn't want to be the strongest person in the room. She could be, but she didn't want to be. She wanted a companionship. She wanted a team to where she could trust and depend on my strength, my backbones, and my balls that, that I could show up when, when I needed to show up. 100%. So for the guys right now, let's say there's a man who's 30 years old and he's been, you know, he's he's a nice guy, nice guy to the T, no no respect for himself. He's a doormat. You know, he's not ambitious. He's not driven right now. He's living with his mother. He doesn't have a job. He's out of shape. What would be your message to that nice guy to begin to, to go on a journey to become an ultimate man and not the nice guy, passive man that he is today. Well, I, I'm a big believer of connecting with men. I, I really think it's our disconnect from other men that's led to a, a lot of the problems that we have. And so that, that in no more Mr. Nice Guy, one of the things, I say the first thing to do is go find safe people. Now for a lot of guys, well, not just young men, but a lot of men, the word safe male is an oxymoron. Because, you know, they didn't grow up with safe males. Maybe they grew up with an angry man, an absent man, a philandering man, a, a, a passive, unavailable wussy man, you know, whatever. Safe male, th those words don't compute in their head. But that is where we got to start. We've got to go get connected with men, whether that's a men's coach, a men's therapist, a men's group, 12-step group, a men's program, martial arts, whatever, we got to go start connecting with men. Because uh, in my program, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with David Data, but, but yep, he- uh, Superior man, that's, uh, that's, no offense to you, you're number two on our list. That's number fine. Number one is to get a superior man. That, that's fine. I, you know, I do a lot of interviews and I rarely, I, I mean, not rarely, I frequently get mentioned in the same breath with David Data, Way the Superior Man, and Jordan Peterson. And he's number he's number three in our list. Only number three is too long. It's too long. It's too fucking long. It's too long. I I actually just wrote that today in in a blog that I love the book, but it's too long. Um, <laughs> I, I was actually writing to writers about the the benefit of having your book edited well. Anyway, yeah. I, I I love both of them, and and I've done workshops with Data. My my coach is a a follower of, of David Data. But, but he came on one of our calls in my men's program. And I, I'm still in a men's program. I, I, I still need this, right? I need the connection with men. I need tribe. And uh, so Data came on a call and just, we were talking about basically men's groups, how to start men's groups. And he said something that I've, I've led men's groups for 25 years, and I never thought of it quite like this. He said, men come to a program. No matter whether they come listen to your podcast or join a men's group or get, get in some kind of program, Mankind Project, whatever. And he said usually they come for one of three reasons. They might have all three, but, but usually yeah. one of them is prominent. He said one is that they, they, they need to be accountable. They, they need to be sharpened. You know, they're, 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 they're procrastinating. They're not living with purpose. You know, they're wasting their lives. And they, they need men to, to hold their feet to the fire and hold them accountable and, hold, and, and sharpen them. So he said, that's one benefit of men connecting with men, is it sharpens us. Another, he says, we come when we need to be held. We're hurting. We're going through a divorce. Uh, we've had a, a significant loss. Maybe we've been lost our job. Maybe something's, we're in pain. 
and we need men to support us. Usually men, if we're in pain, we go to women or to alcohol or porn or something. Those aren't going to support us. We need men mm -hmm. who can understand what we're going through to be there and hear us and not try to fix it. Just be there with us. So we, we do that. And he said the third reason that men join a, a men's program is just to be. And I thought, mm. that's me. I joined the program because I just need to be with men. We're going to go meet for a week up in uh, Northern California next week. And, and I've been in this program for three years, and I love these retreats, is that I'm with 35 other guys that are my band of brothers that I didn't know, any of them, three years ago. Now I, I know 20, at least 25 men over three years in this program, at least 25, 30 men. I could call up any time, day or night, said, I need help they'd be there for me in whatever way I needed. Mm. And that's um, man, that's life changing. And so to yeah. go be with men, be sharpened, be held and just be. As, as my coach was just talking on a call yesterday, you know, there's studies that show if men are just playing together, it raises their testosterone. It, it, mm. it, it improves their mood and their well-being just by playing with other men. So to go back to your question, that is where I'd start. Is, is go find some sort of men's support system and get connected with men. Start being real, start being vulnerable, start opening yourself up, start taking risk, and do that with men. And it's, it's life changing. No, that's great because one of the things, I have a 10 Steps to Healthy Manhood program. I'm actually gonna be releasing the 11th step because I realized the, the missing piece of the 11th step was, you know, connect with other men. And, and so in our Patreon community, we also have like a, a, count, um, a networking sheet. We're kind of working on finding ways to make that a little bit better. But a networking accountability sheet where you can connect with men all around the United, well, United States as well as around the world. And I think you're 100% you're right. Like, uh, like Proverbs says, iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. So I think it's so important that men are able to find like-minded brothers to help them alongside the journey. And another thing that I've noticed is that um, similar to what David Data talks about, uh, talked about to you was that I've also noticed so many guys come into the men's improvement space. So many guys don't want to be nice guys because of the outcomes or the negative outcomes they experience with women. Mm -hmm. That's probably like the biggest thing that I've seen you know, whether she got he got cheated on, he got divorced, he got broken up by. I see so many men making the shift to now trying to get out of the nice guy tendencies or now trying to improve their lives when they go through difficulties with women. So I agree. from your personal experience, what are some of the biggest mistakes you notice that men make with women? <laughs> oh, there's, there's a whole book in there. Um, oh, I've written a couple <laughs> along those lines. You know... Here, here's something I say to men. Whatever the male brain thinks a woman can do for him, it's wrong. Mm. It's wrong. Whatever we meant through, through just social mythology of beginning with our mothers to television to movies to love songs to whatever we think a woman's going to do for us is wrong because she can't. You know, the, the majority of our needs have to be met by men. Uh, it's just, we're just not going to get them met. But what men do is they put everything in one basket, so to speak, and they go, I'll go get a woman, and then she'll, she'll meet all my needs. She'll complete me. Mm. And, and, and she can't. She doesn't want to, but she can't. And, and then when she doesn't, you know, we're, we're hurt. Either like, you know, we're, we're trying to get her to fill our basket, fill our bucket up, and, and she can't do it. And so what most nice guys are doing is we, we get into this pleaser mode, trying to make her happy, trying to do everything right, and we leave her in charge of everything. Um, mm. I, I think one of the biggest pieces, now, now I, I, I have to be really clear about this because I talk with men about setting the tone and leading in their relationship. And, and when, I, when I talk about that, a lot of times guys will say, all right, all right, Dr. Glover, I know when you say take control. And I go, no, I never use the word control. I don't say control your relationship or control mm -hmm. your woman or control anything. Control mm -hmm. you to the best of your ability. No, setting the tone and leading means you have a plan. You know where you're going. You know yes. what excites you. You know what you're passionate yeah. about. And you invite your woman to come join you in that space. 100%. And and. 
I always say that a woman can't follow where a man doesn't lead. And, you know, again, I know that's contrary to all the vibe we hear, oh, you know, about, you know, about women being independent, not needing a man. But, no, I keep hearing over and over again the biggest complaint that women have about men is because the guy thinks, well, she wants to make all the decisions. He leaves them all up to her, and the woman mm-hmm. feels burdened by that. Exactly. I, 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 years ago, I was, got done, I was, I was actually taught a, a small class um, uh, on, on dating, and, and a bunch of the guys wanted to go out and get a bite to eat. So we went to a restaurant that I, I used to hang out in quite a bit when I was a single guy. And, um, and I, I knew all the waiters and waitresses, and one of the waitresses came by, and her name was Jessica. And, I, I, and in front of this group of guys, I said, Jessica, I want to ask you a question. I knew she was single, and I said, how do you like it when the guy you're dating or the guy you're with leaves all the decisions up to you? Says, what do you want to do tonight? Where do you want to go? What do you want to eat? And she just looked at me. She goes, I hate it. <laughs> that was it. I hate it. And then took our order and left. I just looked at all the guys. They, they hate it. They feel burdened. We think we're being nice. So what do you want, dear? What do you want to watch? What do you want to eat? And they just feel burdened. They're, they're, you know, again, if they have a career, I mean, all day long, they're making decisions. They're doing, what, how does this get done, blah, blah. And then they come home or they're with us and we go, what do you want to do? It's like they got to make one more decision. Yeah. So I tell guys, the greatest gift that you can give to, to, to your woman, to a relationship, is to set the tone and lead. Now, it's not to try to get her to do anything or control her. It's to say, here's what I would like. What do you think? You know, come join me. And if she says, well, I'd really rather do this, you can have a negotiation from there. It's not about you getting your way at anything. It's just having a plan. It's just getting the the ball rolling. Now, in in my life, uh, my my wife and I were were sitting outside. Uh, I'm I'm on my third marriage. We were sitting outside last night. We were taking the dog for a walk, and she said, are are we coming up on four years or five years? Our our anniversary is in November. And I said, no, we've been married four and a half years. And she goes, oh, really? And, um, and so we're just kind of talking a little bit about, about the marriage. And she says, I, I didn't see any, any of this coming, you know, 10 years ago. I didn't see my life being this way. You know, we, we, we have a nice home. We can travel. Um, we, we got this really cool dog. Her kids are getting a good education. She was, she was a poor single mom 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And, but, but my point is here is that I'm living life on my terms. I love what I do. I'm making a difference in the world. I, I can make good enough money doing it. I, I'm happy doing it. I'm 65. Most men retire at my age. I, I, I don't even know what that looked look like. I, I still have so many things I want to get done, so many interviews I still need to do. And, yeah. and you know, I'm not a dominant, controlling person at all. But I live life on my terms, and, uh, and I'll, I'll say to my wife, you want to go do this, you want to go do that, you want to go eat here, you want, you don't want to, uh, I'm thinking about buying this car, what do you think? I, you always have a plan, and, yeah. and she just, you know, she'll give me her wisdom and her insight on it, but it's usually, it's kind of like, let's go, let's do it. Or if I say, hey, I think we need this, you know, we finally decided to get a dog about a year ago. She went out and found the dog, and now we've got this amazing pit bull pup that's about a year old you know she 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 could we're a team we get things done but yeah. it's, it's usually me that starts the ball rolling and i mean when, when we first met and got serious and got involved you know i said i, I said i don't know if i want to live here in mexico all my life i said i like a lot of things here but i i might want to live somewhere else and she said wherever you go i'll follow just don't ask yeah. me to leave my kids. And I go, I, I would never do that. I, I'm not going to ask you to leave your kids. And she goes, no, you, you decide there's a better place for us to go live. I'm with you. So, yeah. and, and again, my wife is not a passive person. She grew up eight out of ten kids in, in poverty in Guadalajara, Mexico. She's a tough woman. Um, she works out in our gym two hours every day. She's done my tie. She can out squat me. She's a tough woman. And, and so for her to say, you know, you know, wherever you lead, I'm, I'm there with you. And well, I'll always that, be looking out for her best interest. She knows that. I won't ever make a unilateral decision that doesn't consider what's good for her as well. So that's, that's the gift I think we men can bring, is if we know where we're going in life, and the way David Data says it, he tells women, you know, decide where you want to go, find a man whose train is going that direction, and get on it. 
Now, and I know, I know that, yeah. you know, again, the feminists might not like that model, but yeah, find a man whose life is going in a way that you honor and that you think is amazing and go be a part of that. Go team up with him. Yeah, no, that's powerful. I, I, and, and, and I had this quote that came to me recently. I, I, I said, it's interesting that when a woman calls a man daddy, it's a turn on. But when a man calls his woman mommy, it's a turn off. <laughs> and so, it's, so I think it's very, I tell guys all the time, like you said, life is a dance. And for most women, no matter how masculine, confident, competent they are, most women, and you like this reference because you're in Mexico, most women will not be happy leading the salsa dance from the whole night. Most women, exactly. no matter how skilled she is, no matter how intelligent she is, she does not want to lead the dance. She wants a competent, confident, masculine leader to lead her in the dance. And so I think it's so important, like you said, like um, um, decisiveness, uh, uh, initiative, proactivity, all these things are so important that every single man understands. Because like you said, so many guys... They, they try to, because I, I really believe it goes back to the single motherhood crisis. The, 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 they've been so used to being their mom's surrogate husbands, they really have not learned how to cut the emotional umbilical cord and become a man on his own. And like you said, when you are a man who builds his life, who builds his kingdom, who's walking passionately and, and with integrity and has direction and purpose, you will find that the right kind and caliber of woman will see you and, and willingly want to take part in your dance. But, uh, but something else that you said, and, I, and you don't have to share if you don't want to, and, and I'm curious about this because you said that you started writing the book while you were in your second marriage. And uh, recently, you said four and a half years ago, you entered into your third marriage. So um, your, your second marriage ended after this book came out and as you began to go on your masculine journey. So was it something in which as you became more masculine and competent and confident, um, it, was, uh, it began to create strains on your relationship? You don't have to share if you don't want to, but I'm wondering. Oh, well, I love to. I, I, <laughs> oh, there's, there's nothing about me that's not out there. <laughs> Um, yeah. No, well, that's a good question, and people do ask me that one. They say, well, you know, Robert, you know, you, you've got a Ph.D. in marriage and family therapy. You're a marriage therapist. You know, you, you've been married three times. You know, we have this idea that, you know, if you get married and if you don't stay married, there's, there's a failure in there of some sort. Um, there, it's, it's more, you know, it's more complicated than, than that. Mm -hmm. But here's what happened is, is that. My second wife, who I wrote, who was married to when I wrote No More Mr. Nice Guy, the one that got me into therapy and, and into improvement, she was the big stick upside my head. And, and I'm grateful for her. We're talking today because of her. And I'll, until the day I die, I'll be grateful for, for that woman. And she, she challenged me in so many ways. I, she was intuitive. She was sharp. She wouldn't ever let me off the hook of any of my nice guy behaviors. And without going into detail, she had plenty of her own stuff. And we, we went to a ton of therapy. She calculated at some point, she loved going to therapy. Uh, at some point she said, you know, I think between us we've spent probably $100,000 on therapy. And I go, mm. wow, we could have had a few Mercedes for that. <laughs> and, and, and I now jokingly say, I, I think that was probably 85000 too much to figure out our marriage wasn't going to work. <laughs> I, th I think fifteen grand is enough <laughs> to find out if a marriage is going to work or not. And yeah. so what happened is actually we split about, about six, eight months before the print edition of No More Mr. Nice Guy came out. And um, what I realized, why why we, we split is that I realized I'd made significant changes and I knew when I wrote the book that there was one big piece I wasn't done with yet and that was I knew I was still tolerating too many things in a relationship and mm -hmm. and what what actually happened why our relationship why we broke up she got mad at me about something and said I want you to move out and you know that was not an uncommon thing and um, I said okay and I did. And about two weeks later, she said, I, 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 I changed my mind. I want you to move back. And I said, I ain't coming back. You know, this mm. is hard enough getting out. And I'm not coming back. What I realized is that she was essential for a lot of my personal growth. 
but I'd outgrown that need. And mm. she had not outgrown those things that were still yeah. uh, detrimental to, to our relationship. And so to this day, I, I love her to death. I'm grateful for her. I, I, after being married to her, I then went through a period of about 12 years of living alone and learning how to be a, uh, live alone, be on my own, how to be a single guy, how to date. I ended up writing a book because I, I learned how to date. I wrote a book about that and had some great relationships and learned a lot and grew a lot. And, um, and as I said, you know, my wife and I, I think we met about six, six, maybe almost seven years ago. And uh, we've been married about four and a half years. And um, I wasn't looking. I wasn't looking to get married. Wasn't looking for anything in particular. And uh, like so many good things in life, she found me. And um, mm. after a period of time, I realized this is too good to, to walk away from. And so that's, that's what got, that's a short version of what got me to where I am today. Yeah. And it's fascinating because that's what I, 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 I believe what, what you, what you're going to tell me, because what I've seen happen so often is when guys have these nice guy tendencies, um, and when guys haven't fully tapped into their masculinity, they usually get a woman who's usually more masculine than him. And they usually find a woman who uh, wants to be in charge, who's used to being, um, you know, the leader, who's not happy being the leader, right? But then, but then the, the fundamental change, what I've realized is it's kind of the, I call it the mommy effect, right? That when your mom gives birth to you, you will always be her baby. No matter how tall you are, no matter how big your muscles are, no matter how much money you have, she always views you as her baby because she wiped your diaper, because she, you know, she fed you, because she burped you, you will always be mommy's baby. So when, when you end up be, enter into a relationship where a woman's now taking that masculine motherly role to take care of you, she now views you as her baby. So then eventually when nice guys, you know, read your books or find my content and they begin to build themselves up, tap into the masculinity and want to now lead provocative, um, lead um, passionately, but not just lead passionately. They also want to set boundaries and no longer tolerate unhealth. What they realize is now that woman is unable to now submit to him, unable to follow him because she views him as that baby and she is now conditioned to always being in charge and having her way. So when the man establishes boundary, now they be, the two become incongruent. So I wanted you to share that because I want some of the guys to realize that when you begin to level up and become the best version of yourself, especially if you are currently in an unhealthy relationship and you haven't tapped into your masculinity, you may outgrow the woman that you're with and it's okay. And so I just, I, I really appreciate you sharing that because I see that happen with so many men in my community. Well, you know, I, I say in, in No More Mr. Nice Guy, I kind of referenced that, that, that when I first started working with nice guys, and again, I was, I'm a marriage therapist by training, so I was usually working on their relationships. I said, you know, I, I gave it about a 50-50 chance of, their, of their, their relationship making it as they began dealing with their nice guy issues. Sometimes mm -hmm. their, their woman mm -hmm. would grow right along with them. Sometimes their woman would resist everything they tried to do. Um, and then, I, then after a while, I started saying, well, maybe it's like 60-40 with a 60% <laughs> chance it won't work. And then, then the longer I worked with nice guys, it kind of came more 70. I, I think I'm about at 80, 20 now, somewhere, <laughs> may, may, maybe 35, 65, somewhere in there. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that if, you, and again, without going too far down this road, as a marriage therapist, I'm trained to look at, at relationships as co-created by two people, usually to meet old needs and, and revive old dysfunction because that feels familiar to us. And so, mm. you know, for example, for a nice guy, if part of our dysfunction is, is to go rescue, you know, a, a wounded, broken woman because we were rescuing mom, that kind of thing. And mm. then, um, then we find out either she really didn't need rescuing and then we go, well, but I need to rescue. Um, or, or then maybe we outgrow that need to rescue, but maybe she doesn't outgrow her need to be problematic and have somebody mm. solve her problems for her. And, and so she, she might, you know, she might be a great person, but maybe the nice guy doesn't need her to be problematic anymore so that he can be the rescuer, but she's not done being problematic. 
right? Maybe, maybe she still, you know, has her need to, to be an addict or has her need to be uh, depressed or has her need to be unfaithful. And, and mm. you know, she, she, she hasn't ever gotten over that. So that's why a lot of times there's that, that, that outgrowing the other person because the reason we originally picked the person was usually, as, as I think it was Pia Melody said, we tend to marry people who have some of the worst traits of both of our parents. And we do that unconsciously to work through our own wounds from our parents. We pick partners to help us work through old wounds and use old relationship tools, I call them, from a toolkit that we learned when we were three. How do I get along with mom? How do I get along with dad? Those are the tools we got. So we're going to go pick a woman that we still try to use those tools on. And if they don't fit a woman, we're not going to get with her. But if we find Mm -hmm. a woman that we get to use those tools, oh, this works now. But then when we realize these tools are actually part of the problem, they're, they're perpetuating uh, relationship situations that aren't good, and we start learning new tools, well, maybe that person is going to come along, and, or maybe they're going to say, no, I, I still need... I, you know, if I, if I, I've, I've often said that every major relationship I've been in, the two previous marriages and a couple of other longer-term relationships, pretty much ended because the women reached a point where they just dug their heels into the ground and said, don't expect me to grow anymore. Don't expect me to to work on myself anymore. I am committed to my defense mechanisms. And I I, I now have a phrase, (coughs) excuse me, that, that usually shocks people when I say it, but I say, in my experience as a professional therapist and a professional bumbling my way through my own relationships, I've now come to the conclusion that most people will choose their defense mechanisms over love. Mm. Wow. No, that's 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 true. I've seen it happen one too many times. So, Dr. Glover, I want to I want to be respectful of your time. So there's one last question before we wrap it up. Um, So one of the one of the um, things that I've noticed is that when nice guys come to realization about, you know, how they were lied by society, how mom makes them weak, how, you know, them being a, a pushover to women were ineffective, it causes, like you said, that knee jerk reaction. They get angry, they get this rage, and they now want to go on to the other side. And now they think, okay, I don't want to be a nice guy. Now I'm going to be the jerk because women like jerks and jerks win. And, and you know, the society is <laughs> about being this dominant, you know, powerful alpha who just doesn't listen to anybody, nobody can stop me. So what would be a closing message to men who feel like that they need to go to that extreme to be successful in business, in society, and in, with women? Yeah, you know, and, and I'll say it again. There's a phrase in 12-step program that says the opposite of crazy is still crazy. You know, whenever mm. you're just going from one extreme to the other, nice guys will often say, Robert, okay, I get it. I've read your book. I get the being, you know, passive. A passive doormat doesn't serve me, but I don't want to go be the asshole jerk. I, 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 I want to find, you know, so, you know, a happy medium. And my answer always is I, I don't know where the tipping point is between two dysfunctional extremes. So mm. the answer is not do I just become a little bit less nice or a little bit more asshole or, you know, no. The, the answer is, is, is up above that. It comes from us being able to soothe our anxiety. It comes from us being able to release our shame. It comes from us being able to bond with other men. It comes from us being able to live with purpose and passion and ask ourselves what feels right to me and then do it. It it, it comes from being what I call in the book an integrated male, authentic male, an embodied male, open heart. I mean, there's there's a conscious male. There's a lot of words that we could use for it, but it's not just reacting. It's, it's rewiring our nervous system and developing a new paradigm that, that shows us a new way of interacting with the world. And, and mainly it means doing it on our terms, doing mm. it our way, getting comfortable in our own skin. One of the things that, that I've said that women are naturally attracted to a man who knows where he's going and looks like he's having a good time going there. And, I love um, that. There you go. That's, 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 we'll just leave it with that. No, that's so powerful, Dr. Glove. And I, and I really, uh, really appreciate that closing message, man. I think I'm a, I might, might borrow that one. So when people, when people ask me where I got that from, I'm going to say I got that from you. <laughs> I, I know you will.
<laughs> you're you're a man of integrity. I like that. I, I try I try my best to be. I'm not perfect, but I'm trying to grow and become better every single day. So, Doctor Glover, too. man, this was such a, a, a powerful episode. I hope you young men were taking notes. This is something that you may need to rewatch multiple times. And if you do not have it already, guys, every single man, my recommended reading list. You should have no more Mister Nice Guy by Doctor Robert A. Glover. You should have that book on your bookshelf. Read it at least. Three to four different times. This book will transform your life. Dr. Glover, where can they find you at? DrGlover.com. D-R-G-L-O-V-E-R.com. And if they Google Robert Glover or Google No More Mr. Nice Guy, I got all the top spots. So uh, easy enough to find. <laughs> Sounds great, guys. So be sure to reach out to Dr. Glover, send him a message, let him know what about this podcast stood out to you. My name is Hafiz, and I'm joined by Dr. Robert Glover. <laughs> we are the roommates, and have a great day. <laughs>